haven't had any water. I forgot my water bottle today and I haven't had any girl, water. I am a thirst, I am thirsty. Something that I've been thinking a little bit about recently uh, and something that I see in the comment sections of every short film that we put out is budgets. So something that I wanted to talk about today because there are a vast range of budgets and how to even look at them. And I think oftentimes it's misconstrued or a block for some people. So I did want to go through that. First, starting with what I consider to be five ranges of budgets. Now, again, everything that's about to come is largely my personal opinion. I have talked to a lot of filmmaker friends, including some producers out in Hollywood, some managers, and then just hearing from industry friends as a whole. So my opinion does come from that. Though, once you really dive into it, there is an arbitrary nature to the numbers when you start placing them to the different budget ranges because it varies so much and that's kind of what I want to talk about. So for me there are five levels of budget. You have no budget, micro budget, low budget, mid budget, and high budget. Because these all vary so widely I kind of want to look at it in sections. First starting with independent versus Hollywood level films. Even though oftentimes what is considered an independent feature film, a lot of us think of as larger Hollywood films, larger names, millions of dollars to the budget, but those are independent films. But with independent film, you're stripping away that first level of budget with no budget. Of course, everything can happen sometimes to some extent, but those are very tiny exceptions to the overall rule. But with an independent film, you can have a micro budget, which is oftentimes, from what I understand, somewhere between 100,000 to 500,000. Then, you can have low budget, which would be that 500,000 to somewhere in the 5 million range. Then in the mid range level, you have somewhere between 5 to 50 million. And now these independent films are just films that are being made outside of the main studio system. So they're production companies that are going and finding this financing, getting the films made, and then they're taken to distribution. Now, when you look at more of the Hollywood model, now you're getting rid of micro budgets as well. You're talking somewhere between 10 to 40 million on average, though there are a lot of production companies, especially lately, and depending on genre, that you're looking at sub tens. Like Blumhouse is very well known for making sub $10 million horror films, which is a really great model. I mean, most recently with The Invisible Man, Lee Whannell did that for, I believe, $7 million, which he did an unbelievable job with. It does not look like a $7 million feature. If that is the correct number, they did a killer job at pulling this off at the budget that they had. But even at that scale, 2 million to 10 million to me is all the money in the world, but that would be considered a minuscule budget. But then you move up to more of the mid tier, the mid budget inside of the Hollywood system, which would land somewhere between 40 to 80 range. And then of course you have the high budget movies, which are everything above 80. What's crazy about that is we're just talking about the finances to make the film itself then it has to be marketed. It has to be distributed. So that's a whole extra thing on top of everything else. I know of some friends who have made horror films for sub $10 million, and then that thing went on to have a marketing budget of 30 to $40 million, which is often while you hear, even though a production budget might be a little bit lower and it made that money back in the box office, it still didn't make its money back because it's not counting all of those marketing dollars that went into the thing as well. So that has to be piled into it as well, but we'll ignore the marketing and just talk about production because that's just gonna, it's gonna muddy the waters and I don't know enough about it and it's just, I just don't wanna do it. What makes these numbers even more frustrating and relative is that they're going to change from company to company, studio to studio, filmmaker to filmmaker, and like I said, independent to Hollywood production. So none of the numbers I said are really hard and fast rules that I can gather from talking to all the people that I've talked to or looking into it in the places that I've looked into it, it all varies. And not only that, it's gonna vary depending on where you make the film. Not only country to country, which will alter quite a bit between countries, but state to state inside of the US itself. So overall, the numbers, they're a little confusing. And just my personal classification of those budget ranges, which again, is confusing. And I suppose is the point I'm trying to make. 
moving on. But that is the feature film world. Let's focus on short films because that's really what the majority of us are doing. And again, that's going to vary widely depending on where you're at. Are you an amateur filmmaker just starting out doing this with friends? Is this a film school sort of thing? Is this a passion project? Or is this a commercially viable project? Something where there's sponsors involved and so on. But let's just focus on passion projects because that has been pretty much my entire career. All my films were passion projects and all my films, though ranging wildly in budget, were all low budget films. I know, hear me out. So let's take, for instance, Proximity, which was an incredibly low budget film of $300. And the only reason I was able to get this thing made at all was because of the kindness of people who lent me gear, who lent me their time, who acted in it for free, who made props for me for free and helped me in post for free. That is the only way I was able to get that film made for such a tiny budget, which really I guess you could call a micro budget, but for me was just a low budget at the time because it was around the amount of money I had for almost everything. Then something like I think three years later we made Ghost House for around 20 to $25,000, which was incredibly low budget. And the only reason we were able to pull it off like we pulled it off was because everybody on the higher end, cinematographers, producers, my AD, and everyone in post did it for free. They did it for the passion of the thing and everyone else did it for really reduced rates. We also had gear loaned to us and had a lot of favors. But there's stuff like catering, the logistics of where people go into the bathroom, where are they gonna park, gas for their cars, hotels, transportation, like flights if they need them, the location itself, any props that you can't beg, borrow, and steal. Those price tags really start to build up over time when you're trying to operate on a level like that, where it's more like making an independent feature film. Then moving on again to about a year and a half later, we made my short film Sentinel which I did for $200 and it was very low budget. And the only reason I was able to pull it off was because everybody did it for free, including people in post-production like my friend, Andrew Kramer, who handled the visual effects and helped us make it look amazing. Then about a year later, we released my biggest short film that we've ever made, which was Ballistic, which was the very low budget of over $100,000. I believe in the end, it was somewhere in the $120,000 range. And the only reason I was able to pull off Ballistic was because all of my producers, my cinematographer, my editor, everyone in post, all of these people, the majority of people either did it for half rate or for free just for the passion of the project. And that is the only way we were able to get this film done. We had tons of gear loaned to us. We had friends at Canon and other places help us out with cameras. And that's how we were able to pull that off. What's insane is when you start doing things on that sort of a level, when you're mimicking how you would make a feature film, especially something like Ballistic, when there's so many moving parts, we had to blow up a car, which means we had to buy that car. We were working in a movie ranch to get the location we wanted because we were going to be doing pyrotechnics and big stunts. So this had to be a place built for that, that we would be allowed to do that, and that would be completely under our control. But within this place, if I needed to move cars around to sort of situate the scene the way I really needed it to do, it cost us money every time we just wanted to move a car at the location. So if we moved three cars, it was about six to $700 just to move a car. Just being able to feed people and having a place for them to sit to eat. At some point, it's going to be at night because we're getting there at four in the morning, which means now we have to have lighting. So now we have to have a generator just for people to be able to eat. So all these considerations start popping up when you have a larger crew and you're operating at that level. So at that level, $120,000 is pretty much the exact same amount of money as I had when I made Ghost House for $20,000. So what's crazy is it feels like you have less money the more money you have. I, I felt under much tighter constraints and a much tighter belt and a lot more stressed about pulling ballistic off with that much money than I did with things that cost $5,000 to make. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is to address the comments that I see in our BTS for our short films. When people are saying things about what cameras we had, what crew we had, what lenses we were shooting on. All those things are nice. And like I've said before, it's like having a drill instead of a screwdriver. You can get the same thing done with a screwdriver. It's just gonna be a lot harder. So getting the idea of what budget someone else had or what resources someone else had 
out of your head and just focus on the concepts that are being presented. Like for instance, I've been watching the Knives Out behind the scenes and they're obviously operating on a much higher level than I'm currently operating on. I think that film was somewhere in the 40 to $50 million range, I'm not positive, but it was somewhere in that range. But if you just pay attention to the concepts, what Ryan Johnson is doing in the scene, how he's setting up the scene, what he's doing with the camera, how he's interacting with the actor, these are the takeaways that you're really looking for. And to complain about what camera someone's shooting on in their BTS seems as silly to me as being upset about going to film school and them teaching you on an Alexa instead of an iPhone. It reminds me of something I have talked about on the show of when I was younger and you know shooting on a VHS camera, editing from VCR to VCR. My favorite show was Movie Magic, which was a show that showed you behind the scenes of how they made things like Terminator 2. Obviously, as a kid of that age with a VHS camera, I couldn't replicate anything that they were doing, but it taught me the concepts the ideas, the ingenuity behind what they were accomplishing. And not only that, most importantly, why they were doing it. And I learned things like forced perspective, using miniatures, montage. And those concepts are really what's going to help you learn and build toward creating something that's effective for your audience. Using an Alexa to shoot your film is not going to make it better. It might make it easier to make it look prettier, but it's not gonna make the film better. I guarantee you, every audience member would rather watch a great film shot on an iPhone than a mediocre film shot on film or an Alexa. And I hope this doesn't seem like I'm defending our work. There's nothing to defend. I'm very proud of the network and resources we've been able to build over the last 10 years, 12 years really, but 10 years publicly through Film Riot. And that was always the point of Film Riot, to start from having absolutely no money whatsoever, literally in my mom's house on a home video camera, moving to the point that we are now so people could watch that progression over time and it become a weird new different type of film school. But I think all of this and the reason I wanted to talk about it could be boiled down to a comment like I saw from There Comes a Knocking's BTS when someone talked about us using a proper dolly and saying that almost as a negative. Well, of course, XYZ because they had this dolly. Well, think about why we used the dolly. Don't think about the gear. Think about what technique was being used, if it was effective for you, of course. If you watched a short film and the moment was effective for you, why was it effective? Okay, we did dolly. Well, what did that mean? Why did we dolly? And then analyzing that, breaking that down and applying it to your own work. If it was effective for you, then utilize that in your own work. And similar to what I did when I didn't have resources to get a dolly, I couldn't do a dolly, so I did a slider. Before I had money to be able to do a slider, I used a towel. A towel with the camera on top of that, on top of a smooth surface, and I would just pull the towel and I had my dolly shot. And if you don't have that, just shoot as smooth as you can and stabilize in post. Again, it's all about the concepts and what you're trying to achieve. But to wrap it up, low budget is an entirely relative thing and can mean anything from $20 to $2 million, depending on who you're asking. Stop making it about the money and the resources. Start making it about the concepts. But that is it for today. Before I go, I have two suggestions of the week, which we don't really do that often, but I have two suggestions of the week. The first one is from my friend Seth Worley, who just released his new short film, which is fantastic and you should absolutely check out. It's massively imaginative, it's gorgeous to look at, great visual effects, and the coolest thing about it is it's a proof of concept for a feature that he's pitching right now. I've been able to read the feature script and I absolutely love it. So selfishly, I want you all to watch the short film and share it with everyone you've ever known in the history of time because I really want to see this feature get made because selfishly, I, ju I just want to watch it. So check that out. Bunch of great BTS on uh, how it was all made as well. We'll put links to that in the description below. The second one is from my friend Ryan Booth, who was my cinematographer on Ghost House and UFO Yeah, but has since gone on to be an insanely talented direct, all kinds of commercials. He's just, he's an amazing director, has been working on a feature for quite a while and is now uh, in the funding stage, which he's doing a crowdfunding model, which is different from Kickstarter. It's more of an investment thing. So you make money when the film makes money. There's detail on the page on how to do that. I've already given to it, plan to give it to it more because selfishly, I just want to see the movie. So link Thanks for that in the description below as well. Until next time, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat.